Today's Vietnam is a vibrant country, full of promise, both in the countryside and in the city. One might never guess that 30 years ago, war ravaged this land and its people. My name is Ed Neff. I spent 17 years as a Foreign Service officer with the U.S. State Department, and then five years as a staffer in the U.S. Senate. Before deciding, I wanted to see what the real world was all about. I had learned firsthand how important the ability to speak other languages was in the world. So I decided to set up schools here and abroad to teach English and other foreign languages. At an educational conference, I met Thuy Thu Do, a Vietnamese businesswoman. She shared my interest. Thuy wanted to open an English language school in Vietnam. She invited me to come visit her in Hanoi. That visit opened my eyes to this incredible land and its people and helped me better understand how reconciliation between two enemies was possible. I decided to travel the length of the country and Thuy would be my guide. Thuy and I toured the country with American combat veterans. We visited their old battlefields and met with combat veterans from the other side. I accompanied Lee King, a Vietnamese expatriate, on her first visit to her ancestral village in 50 years. I visited with American businessmen who have invested here, have prospered, and are contributing to the economic development of Vietnam. I also interviewed several scholars and discussed with them a question that particularly nagged me. Why did the United States go to war in the first place? What were the lessons we learned from that war? And even more important for me, how are we passing them on to the next generation? Both sides suffered tremendously during the war. Civilians like Thuy in Vietnam and combat vets like Chip Troiano in America. Lyndon Johnson was president during the initial phases of the war. He spoke with determination about the war's outcome. His words resonated with the American people. We will not grow tired. We will not withdraw, either openly or under the cloak of a meaningless agreement. We will not be defeated. No one mentioned that the war might have been avoided. Only later did we learn of Ho Chi Minh's plea for help. In 1945, he wrote President Harry Truman this letter. I most earnestly appeal to you personally and to the American people to intervene urgently in support of our independence. Truman never replied. President Nixon followed Johnson. His administration threatened to bomb Vietnam back into the Stone Ages. The bombing devastated the country. Nearly three million Vietnamese were killed during the war. Several bombs hit central Hanoi. The Vietnamese exploited the event in propaganda films to instill patriotism. <laughs> một đường phố những hàng cây bàn tán lá khỏe rất tươi đẹp. Nixon đã chọn để giải thảm B-52 suốt dọc sáu khối phố lương tâm nước Mỹ như người Mỹ đã nói và làm cho thế giới lợm dọc và căm hờn. Ho Chi Minh rallied the Vietnamese people. Chiến tranh có thể kéo dài 5 năm, 10 năm, 20 năm hoặc lâu hơn nữa. Hà Nội, Hải Phòng và một số thành phố xí nghiệp có thể bị tàn phá. Trong khi hơn độc lập tự do, đến ngày thắng lợi, nhân dân ta sẽ xây dựng lại đất nước ta đàng hoàng hơn, to đẹp hơn. The longer the war went on, the more it was opposed in the United States. On November 15, 1969, 600,000 demonstrators came to Washington to protest the war. I was working for the Peace Corps in Washington. 
That day, former Peace Corps volunteers seized our building and hung a Viet Cong flag from the eighth floor. I thought that was wrong. I disapproved of the war, but I did not think we should abandon our friends and allies. Many say the United States actually won the Battle of Armies, but it was the protesters who won in the end. In 1975, the United States cut its losses and withdrew. Sadly, in victory, nothing but misery came to the Vietnamese people. David Lan, noted author of the best-selling and highly acclaimed book, Vietnam Now, describes it best. Vietnam sunk into uh, a deep, deep depression and really was on the border of, of starvation. They knew that the Communist Party really had two choices. One was to reform and the other was to disappear. They chose the, the former, to reform. Vietnam implemented a course known as Doi Moi, or renovation. Today, production is soaring throughout Vietnam. The country's annual growth is at 8.5%, and the United States is Vietnam's largest export market. Two-way trade is in excess of $10 billion a year. Vietnam is now Asia's newest economic tiger. What a radical change from 20 years ago. Senator Max Baucus of Montana, chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, helped pave the way toward normalization between the two former enemies. We've reached the end of the journey toward normalization. It says, now it's a whole new step here. Uh, this is, now we move even more to, uh, enthusiastically toward the future, that there's a, a very strong sense in the Congress that, that, uh, that hey, hey, Vietnam's doing great, uh, they're, doing, they're doing well, the United States should respect that, honor that, and not only that, it's an opportunity. On my first trip to Vietnam, Thuy took me to the elementary school near Haiphong, which she attended when she was a young girl. The American bombing was at its most intense. The North Vietnamese government had evacuated all school children to the countryside for their safety. I learned how the war had affected her. Baby, I study in here. And so whenever bombing, so we go down to the, the pool inside, inside the land. But so I, I don't know the way the pool. Yes, I can remember exactly. There are lots of bombing. It's a very scary. And the bomb, whenever the bombing, I see dark smoke and fire at night. My father stays in Haiphong. It's one time so my father uh, go by bicycle past my school here. So he picked me up, uh, not during the day, because of the day is bombing a lot, so we have to go at night. So in the city, people so go to the countryside to avoid the bomb. It's very emotional when, when I met my mother after two years. So we miss only four days. So I have to go back to my school at night. I, I remember that. I don't know the, how, how I, I can become a very tall and very big woman like this. Because when I was a child, I have nothing to eat and no rice, if no rice to eat. I have only one. On both of rice a day, but I'm I'm now so very big and very and very tall. Yes, I know that everything is over now. My my country is developed very fast, but some people still very poor. That's why I I want to open my my English my English center and to teach for. The 
sunken to know the, another language. So it's a useful for them. This is the monument to Senator McCain. He crashed in this lake. Despite her memories of the American War, 25 years later, Twee felt that an American education for her daughter would be best. She graduated from the University of Florida in 2006. This was one of many steps Vietnamese and Americans have taken since 1975 toward reconciliation. So what brought our two countries together? Steps towards reconciliation weren't taken by statesmen or politicians. They were taken by the very men that fought the war. In 1981, when a uh, Bobby Muller, who had gone to Vietnam as a gung-ho lieutenant, was wounded, became a paraplegic, and came back to the United States as an anti-war activist. And he decided the only way that the Americans could move beyond the war was to have reconciliation, to meet the people they had fought. And he went back, and they had a very tearful reunion, the, the North Vietnamese soldiers and the Americans, hugging, drinking beer, talking, crying. And Bobby went back to the United States, and he told other GIs, he said, look, you can do this. You've got to do it. You've got to go back. And that really, uh, that built the bridge. But there was one snag. Americans, particularly Vietnam veterans, demanded to know what had happened to their buddies, the missing in action those who never returned from Vietnam. Every Memorial Day since 1988, veterans, their friends, and the next generations of veterans have paraded through the nation's capital on their motorcycles with flags proclaiming, lest we forget, to call attention to those missing in action from all wars. The event is called Rolling Thunder. The veterans' protest was heard in Washington and Hanoi. The two governments began to work together. By 2007, the remains of over 1,600 American soldiers have been returned. That search continues today. Many veterans are returning to Vietnam, some to seek personal closure, others out of curiosity. Many have stayed to help the Vietnamese achieve better lives. Chuck Searcy with the Vietnam Memorial Foundation is one. In 1967, he served in Vietnam in a military intelligence unit. During that year, I, I grew to like the country very much and the people, uh, despite the tragedy of the war, and it really was tragic for everybody concerned. Um, and when I went back home over the years, I thought that it would be great to find a way to come back to Vietnam. Finally, I came back in 1992 with an old army buddy as a tourist, and we traveled the whole country. And at that time, I could see a country in recovery, uh, still with a lot of needs and a lot of problems. And I started thinking, maybe there's some way I can come back here and do something. And uh, I found a way in 1995. I came here and started a humanitarian program working on a project uh, to help clean up the landmines and unexploded bombs and munitions left over from the war. Some 30,000 Vietnamese have been wounded or killed by unexploded ordnance since the end of the war. We visited one landmine victim who showed us his prosthetic device. He lost his leg and part of his hand when he picked up a landmine in his rice paddy and attempted to dispose of it. The assistance provided by returning American veterans like Searcy offer yet another aspect of reconciliation. Uh, that there were so many mistakes that we made and the, so much misinformation on which the policy was based that it was just, uh, it was tragically wrong. And I did not intend for Vietnam to become such a part of my life, but it, uh, that was such a profound experience for me as it was for most GIs that uh, Vietnam became very much woven into the fabric of my life over the years, even when, even long before I came back to Vietnam. For many vets, visiting the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C. begins to heal their wounds. Chip Troiano is one. Some people say that the uh, memorial looks like a black scar on the earth. I kind of thought that was appropriate. That's my memory of, of the whole incident, of the whole thing. But yet it reflects 
the images of the people that walk by and then look into it. When you look into the name of someone that you know that's on the wall. You look back at yourself. It's a good memorial. Chip Troiano fought as a member of an infantry platoon in Vietnam and as a door gunner on an attack helicopter. His recollections remain vivid to this day. I was about 19, I think, when I was drafted and shipped out on uh, November 26, 1966 from uh, Andrews Air Force Base. Formation with uh, all our field gear and uh, weapons and ammunition and we boarded a C-130 transport plane and two and a half days later we arrived in Saigon. It was an uh, interesting time. I was assigned to the 11th Armored Cavalry uh, Regiment and I remember forming up in, in a line of twos uh, and they dropped that fantail and the first thing I remember was this incredible heat just just like, just like overwhelmed you. I have to say, ambush patrol is about the scariest thing that, that happened in, in, in Vietnam. Laying on the jungle floor in pitch black. So there, were, there was no light on the horizon, there were no light anywhere. I, when I came back, people would say, uh, weren't you scared? And I'd say, ah, no. <laughs> it certainly was a, a, a scary thing. Number of firefights, uh, we could, you, you could smell the enemy. That, that's, that's how close we were. You, could, you couldn't see them. Um, oftentimes you couldn't hear them. You could smell them. And it would be uh, you know, like, okay, something's, something's happening, something's coming. That was Chip Troiano, soldier warrior. I came to the dedication of this wall. We walked out onto Constitution Avenue and I couldn't understand why the people were thanking us. I couldn't understand. But it was okay that they did. Maybe that's the time that the ungrateful nation became grateful. I don't know. I'm not sure. Evans. This guy was Thomas Evans. He was in your unit. Chip and I and several other Vietnam veterans returned to Vietnam together. This notion of reconciliation captivated us all. We started our journey at Quang Tri. One stop was at a bombed out church on a street called The Street Without Joy. Advisors, there was fierce fighting um, in which... Well, of course, we're supporting Quezon and Contien and Gio Lin up on mm -hmm. the DMZ, and they were always under heavy, heavy fire. We were a loose-knit group of travelers. There was Chip. Gary Cunningham was another veteran. As a Marine helicopter pilot, Gary had survived battles around Quezon and the DMZ, the demilitarized zone. In uh, 1967, early one morning, and just as I lifted off the ground, I turned around and the uh, fuel dump where we stored our fuel was uh, up in flames. Uh, the mortar fire had, had hit our fuel dump and it uh, began to burn and then uh, the mortar fire hit our ammo dump and the ammo fire started cooking off and it was a spectacular display and uh, I flew all that day we picked up our medevac up near the DMZ and we couldn't come back, couldn't come back to the airport because it was under attack. And as we know, uh, young people are, are going to live forever. There's no sense of mortality. On the, one of the first flights that we took out of Da Nang, uh, our gunner uh, was shot as we exited to one of the landing zones. So it brought to our attention quickly the reality that we faced. Dave Gorby caught up with the group later. He was also a helicopter pilot in the Kuchi area. His memories, not only of the war, but also the difficulties faced by his family back in the United States are still vivid. And therefore, all the things that I saw and experienced that nobody should see, anybody that's been in combat is affected for the rest of their life. It is just, you see things, you do things, and I never fired a bullet in anger. Uh, I was trying to keep that aircraft in the air. I was very busy just trying to survive and keeping the people in the back of me surviving. 
For all his harrowing adventures in Vietnam, to this day, Dave feels more animosity to those who oppose the war at home than toward the Vietnamese. They equated us with the Vietnam War. They dirty all of us, and they made us all basically war, war criminals. I've been called baby killer. I've been asked how many people I've thrown out of my helicopter. I've been spit at. My wife, I tell a story. She was sitting in a pool with the baby and my two other kids, and a woman walked up to her a month after, probably a month after the birth at the pool, and said, I hope you become a widow. You deserve it for letting your husband go over there and fight. Now, that's a terrible thing to say to a brand new mother. Many more stories were shared as we visited other sites where the veterans fought. Kessan, the longest and deadliest battle of the war. Que, where North Vietnamese forces surprised their American foes by initiating their attack during Tet, the largest Vietnamese holiday. We also visited the citadel, the ancient capital of Vietnam. We had fun even You're dressing up favorite. as emperors of old. <laughs> You're not our favorite yeah. person. <laughs> we also visited China Beach where our troops went for rest and recreation during the war. In Kuchi, north of Saigon, we saw the famous tunnels built by the Vietnamese directly underneath yeah. American troop encampments. Today, Kuchi is a major tourist attraction. Try. Walk away. Yeah. See really? Really? Can't. Disappear. Really? You can hold up, hold the lip. Oh, nice. Chip Torriano remembered the booby traps that tourists now gawk at. Uh, some of the above ground exhibits include a lot of these uh, booby traps and uh, bungee pits and things like that. But we certainly warned about them. You know, I remember the warnings were that uh, they would coat the bungee stakes, coat them with either human waste or buffalo dung to the infection that you would get as a result of these things. We visited the Vietnamese National Military Cemetery where our veterans paid their respects. As emotional as it was for the American veterans, for the Vietnamese visiting this cemetery, it is an overwhelming experience. Nikki Fong, Thuy's niece, accompanied us. She was particularly interested in visiting the cemetery because her grandfather is buried here. <coughs> chiến đấu trong chiến trường miền Nam và đã mất ở chiến trường um, trong Đà Nẵng. Um, đến đây thì cháu cảm thấy rất xúc động và cảm ơn tất cả các anh hùng liệt sĩ đã hy sinh cho tổ quốc. Some of our most moving encounters were visits with former enemy combatants. And one of our points that we are emphasizing is that the veterans of both sides have played a very important role in bringing the two countries together. Thank you again very much for meeting with us and and 
cultivating this friendship uh, that will go on in the future for a long time. And this is the culmination of a 37 year dream that I have had for returning to Vietnam. I was in the Army in 1968, 69, 82nd Airborne. And the war was the war was a long time ago. And it's wonderful that we can put our differences behind us and move forward. And I'm very happy to see the prosperity in this country now. And the changes are wonderful. At one meeting, Thuy was particularly interested in the story of one high-ranking woman combatant. Some meetings were very emotional. One such encounter was with the Vietnamese vets from the Kuchi area. If anything still bothers me about the war, it's the number of young men that I carried back in the back of my helicopter, which we treated very respectfully, and brought back here to be shipped back to their mothers, their girlfriends, their wives, their children, whatever it happens to be. The Vietnamese combat veterans speak with the great feeling about the war. It is very emotional. They talk about their long journeys on foot from Haiphong down to the battlefield front. Often they travel for many months, even when they are having a good time. They think about the sacrifice, Conrad, even when they eat or sleep. But they say, we should not keep that sorrows in mind. We tend to put the past aside. Um, they want to move forward, to sex a hand with American veterans to make the relationship better. Conversations often turned to the impact of Agent Orange. Almost all Vietnamese veterans were affected by it, but it turns out they were not alone. I have diabetes. Uh, late onset diabetes, I was 60, I'm 67. Uh, I, 62, 63, I came down with diabetes and they said it was the Agent Orange. Skimming over the jungles in notorious Zone D, these C-123s of the 309th Air Commando Squadron have a unique assignment, defoliation. The spray materials used are harmless to humans, animals, soil, and water. On this flight, they are spraying the jungle to defoliate the areas around an Army Special Forces camp. With the camp's perimeter stripped of foliage, there is less chance of a surprise VC attack. Defoliation an important Air Force mission in support of our ground forces. What Agent Orange has done to third generation of Vietnamese was all too evident at Friendship Village outside Hanoi, started by George Mizo, a combat veteran. Another combat veteran, Sewell Jones, has been working at the village and he showed us around the facilities. Most of its patients are now second and third generation, having suffered genetic damage far beyond what one expected. I, now I have 120 kids living out here. But this is a veterans-based organization, working with the veterans of Vietnam for peace and reconciliation. Uh, we feel like you know, they deserve it. We want to work with them to make it a better, better country. Sewell was with the 3rd Marines in the thick of the war during the bitter fighting at the DMZ. Now, his work with kids is supported by veterans from both sides. He is also proud to tell of work done by individual Americans. One school, one bridge, one hospital. What makes it really unique out here is that I work with the veterans. 
So I get to talk to these guys all the time I fought against. Them. They're angry at my country and they're angry at our politics, which is understandable, but they don't blame me. They understand that the situation with Agent Orange, of course, as it goes along, the longer it goes on, the more it's difficult to prove for the two or three or four generations. But they do, they do know that, you know, that how much we sprayed here and what it really did to this country. And I don't really think they're asking for, for us to get on our knees and beg for forgiveness, but I do think they want us to understand what happened here. Reconciliation has come a long way since 1981, when Bobby Muller first challenged veterans to come back and help rebuild Vietnam. Virginia Foote, like many of the American veterans she works with, has been working for reconciliation since the 1980s. The two governments are now, and NGOs, are now working on Agent Orange. And it, it wasn't that long ago when those words couldn't be uttered. Um, and yet now, there are, our Congress has passed um, some seed money for Agent Orange cleanup work. Um, our President, uh, President Bush, mentioned it in the address uh, in his statement a year and a half ago when the uh, President of Vietnam was here. Um, so it's now, it's, it's a project that I think we all wondered whether we could ever get to. But we are now, we are, we are working on it. Um, and I think that's, that may be, everybody keeps saying, what's the last chapter of normalization? Maybe Agent Orange is the last chapter, but, um, but I think you have to keep working on these issues. Reconnecting Vietnam and America has taken many routes, not only through personal acts of charity and goodwill, but also in the world of business. Vietnam is attracting major American investments. In the middle of the South China Sea, an American oil company, SoCo, is developing Vietnam's oil fields in partnership with the Communist government of Vietnam. Ed Story is president and CEO of SoCo. Uh, I've been in this industry, the oil industry, for more years than I care to remember. But uh, I spent a number of those years out in the Far East. Uh, we introduced uh, a new concept for Vietnam, and that was the concept of conducting exploration and development in a joint venture structure with the state oil company to accept the state oil company as an equal and, and decision-making partner to carry out oil exploration. And there was a competitive bid round in the late 1990s, and uh, we thought that that would give us a huge advantage versus the major oil companies. So we thought if we introduce this joint venture structure, that many of the major oil companies would find that unacceptable because they're accustomed to doing it only their way and not having to listen to others. And indeed, that's uh, what has caused this to be a success. But there's another Vietnam that business investments haven't reached and tourists rarely see. It's an area where the Vietnam infrastructure remains underdeveloped. Subsistence agriculture dominates the lives of the rural population. Although electricity has reached 90% of the nation, ensuring access to health care, clean water, and education are some of the issues that have yet to be adequately addressed. This rundown schoolhouse is this region's only school. America. America. Oh, oh, you are from America. Yeah. You are from America, man. You come in here, you put a lot of something in there. You don't buy little something for me. <laughs> this souvenir saleswoman has the warmth and charm of the Vietnamese people and illustrates that even in the remotest corners of Vietnam, English is used. She learns from tourists who buy her goods. Although life continues as usual in the rural countryside, the music blasting out of the Samsung dealership shows how rapidly change has come to the rest of Vietnam. The Vietnamese government is radically modernizing its economic structures to help all its citizens better compete on the world stage. Many of these initiatives were inconceivable a few short years ago.
In Ho Chi Minh City, Fred Burke, an American lawyer, explains the challenges. If my mother had ever thought that I would be ending up in Vietnam <laughs> when I was a teenager <laughs> under these conditions, you know, nobody could have imagined. I mean, even myself, you know, back in 1973 or something when we were little protesters yeah, in San Francisco, yeah, you know, to imagine what the thing is, whole, the whole thing is like today. Vietnam and the, is, is really a very friendly country when it comes to the United States. It's, Fred came to Vietnam in 1991. The United States lifted its trade embargo against Vietnam in 1994. And we get involved in you know, helping investors come in, set up new factories, new businesses, but we also, at the same time, are very engaged with the government in changing all the laws to um, get Vietnam into a place where it can compete with the rest of the world, where it can really integrate with the international economy. Basically, every single law that affects doing business has been either introduced de novo or fundamentally amended in the last two years. I visited a textile mill that produces top-of-the-line U.S. clothing apparel and saw how far Vietnam has come. An executive from the company gave us some pretty impressive statistics. Uh, we, we export to U.S. about 72 percent, and to Europe, 10 percent, and to Japan, 18 percent. The company, privatized in 2006, has knitting, sewing, and spinning mills. In 2004, they exported product worth $20 million to the United States. In 2005, $23 million. In 2006, $28 million. To see a bit more of U.S. investments in Vietnam, we visited a large U.S. real estate development firm operating in Ho Chi Minh City. Sure. Uh, we, we started Indochina Capital and Indochina Land back in uh, 1999, and we, uh, we uh, have slowly built the company up from a smaller group of maybe five people down to over 150. We now manage uh, two, three funds uh, with over half a billion dollars of uh, capital from all over the world who invest in the business. Another project of the American partners is to create a beach resort from an island that held an infamous prison during the Vietnam War. Here's another project over here where we have already completed it and, and sold. Uh, these are villas on China Beach, which is up in Da Nang. They go for uh, one to two million dollars. Most people, myself included, uh, just look at the future. Just, we share a sense of optimism about the future right now. So optimism and friendly cooperation pervades our commercial and economic relationship. Adam Sitkoff, executive director of the American Chamber of Commerce in Hanoi, wraps it up best. And I think a lot of people in the United States are still surprised uh, when they hear, oh, well, there's an American Chamber of Commerce in Vietnam or all these... The United States is now one of the largest investors in Vietnam. It is also the largest importer of Vietnamese products, giving testimony to the success of Vietnamese and American business partnerships. By 2010, Vietnam hopes to move to become a middle-income country, so they've got to raise their per capita GDP by another 50 percent, let's say. Sitkoff attributes the Vietnamese government's rapid change to the demands of its young and eager growing population. This is why the government must move forward. There is no going back, I guess you could say. I, I don't think that a large group of people would be willing to give up their standard of living that comes with that. And so uh, I don't see much of a threat. But there are other problems the Vietnamese are dealing with. Fred Burke reminded me of the tensions that still exist between the government and the Viet Cue, those Vietnamese who fled the country after the war. The older generation lost a lot and suffered a lot, so you can understand why they'd be a little bit hesitant to jump back in. On the other hand, every day we see people, you know, even the older generation coming back, we see younger um, people who've been born or at least raised in the United States coming back and contributing a lot to the economy here, whether it's in the IT sector, even law and other, other services. So um, they're playing a huge role in the economy, and even financially, I mean, $3 billion a year in remittances uh, really does contribute a lot at the grassroots level, where families will open up a restaurant or a shop based on the, on the remittances that they've gotten from their families abroad. At the Soko oil rigs, I met Hai Win, a Vietnamese-American who fled to the United States as a boy and subsequently learned the oil business. I was away from Vietnam for like 20 years. So first time come back, I look at the people working in Vietnam at the time. 
the uh, European, the American, the Chinese, the, and here I'm a Vietnamese American. I can speak Vietnamese, and I'm in the oil business for 20 years. There must be a room for me here in Vietnam to do something related to my experience. With what I've learned, I would recommend that the Vietnamese overseas they would come back and uh, at the same time bringing the knowledge from uh, working outside and sharing the growth of Vietnam. And I think that is very happy. Uh, Thank you very much. Other expatriate Vietnamese vow never to go back. San Francisco judge Fan Quang Thue is one. So, yeah, here we are. I've never been back to Vietnam since 1975. But I, I, I don't want to go back, and, and I won't go back until there is a change in, in Vietnam. From 1975, or 65 when the first unit of the marine landed at Dainan. Until now, we're still under the communist system. I didn't have to flee my country. I didn't have to leave everything that I called home. And in many cases, um, these were people who had considerable status as well as uh, incomes in these country and had to come to this come to America and, and start all over again. And they were, frankly, grateful for that opportunity. Their patriotism is fiercely American. And um, talk about reconciliation. Those are the folks who don't want any kind of reconciliation. It's, um, it's the young in Vietnam, and I believe over two-thirds of the population is still under 25 years of age. So you have a very young country that didn't directly feel the war, and they're ready to move on. Uh, the, the country is still a communist country, but given the internet and everything else, it's very hard to keep a closed society. I accompanied Lee King, who fled her home in North Vietnam when the country was partitioned in the 1950s. She was returning to her ancestral village to visit her family, whom she had not seen in 52 years. <laughs> Lee King's husband, an American, worked in Vietnam during the war. As is the tradition in Vietnam, Lee went to the cemetery where her grandparents are buried to pay respects to her ancestors. The journey home was an emotional one for the family, including her daughter Charlene. Charlene was touched by the reunion, as was I. As we left the cemetery, I couldn't help but ask myself, so why did we go to war in the first place? Was it communism or something else? I learned that the answer is not that easy. Robert McNamara, Dean Rusk, and Lyndon Johnson were three highly esteemed men who were among the architects of the Vietnam War. President Johnson told us it was a war against communist China, that if Vietnam fell, the rest of Southeast Asia would also go communist. The press dubbed it the domino theory. It became evident that, in the long run, it was China, not Vietnam, whom the U.S. was trying to stop. President Lyndon Johnson spoke at Johns Hopkins University. This is a regime which has destroyed freedom in Tibet, which has attacked India, and has been condemned by the United Nations for aggression in Korea. It is a nation which is helping the forces of violence in almost every continent. The contest in Vietnam is part of a wider pattern of aggressive purposes. If what Johnson said is true, I find it ironic that soon after the Vietnam War ended, Vietnam was fighting again. Who was its adversary? 
communist China. So was Vietnam a puppet of China or an independent country trying to gain and sustain its independence? Many Americans don't realize that the Vietnamese in 1954 fought their French colonizers to set themselves up as a free and independent nation. I discussed these questions with several respected students of Vietnam's history. At Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts, Seth Bardot teaches the lessons of the Vietnam War to his students. I think that, um, you know, if you look at the Geneva Accords and the Americans' refusal to let this election continue in 1954, in some ways, um, like Iran and setting up the Shah, I mean, the West set up Vietnam to have a, a civil war. So we bear a fair amount of that responsibility. Eisenhower himself said that had there been an election, that Ho Chi Minh would have won overwhelmingly, that he referred to Ho Chi Minh as the George Washington of their country. So we interceded in that process. And if the French or anyone else had interceded in our civil war, it would have turned out to be a very different conflict. Lady Borden has written about Ho Chi Minh for over 30 years and wants to set the record straight. Ho Chi Minh was a nationalist. And so the effort was to stop the move for independence. And it was couched under a fight against communism. But if you look at any of the documents from the time, the speeches and so on, Ho Chi Minh and the people around him, he was a communist, but he was primarily a nationalist. Like everyone else, I was amazed to learn that Vietnam's Declaration of Independence was largely based on the American Declaration of Independence and on the French Declaration of the Rights of Man. In some cases, the language is verbatim. I visited a school in Hanoi to find out what the Vietnamese were teaching about the history of the conflict between our two countries. Đứng trên phương diện là người giảng dạy cho các em về cái lịch sử của dân tộc mình thì bao giờ cũng có cái The war she told me has helped her students understand the determination of the country to protect its independence. She also explained how Vietnam now teaches its students to put aside the past and move forward to have a better future. Students here were eager to visit the United States. I asked why. Why would you like to visit America? Why would you like to visit America. <laughs> Seth Bardo has many concerns. Unlike Vietnamese students, American students are taught little about one of the United States' most brutal and long-lasting conflicts. What's wrong with American education that today we can say that we have learned nothing from Vietnam. Absolutely, and we bear a huge responsibility in not teaching it. And I think it's, it's more egregious because students do have an interest in this time period because the references come up all the time. And so, so do educators bear a responsibility? As I said, I, I think a terrible responsibility. Now, Mi Lai, as you well know, is a central event in the Vietnam War. And really a central event, I think, in that whole time period. Because post-World War II, this country believed that we were the good guys. And what, what this event showed in, in the killing of uh, elderly men, women, children, babies, uh, all of whom were unarmed in a village, it showed the American public the, about the kind of war that was being done. And now we have this next generation, they know very few references, and here's a critical one, they have no idea. It's about moral choices. 
And if you're not going to prepare kids to make moral choices, then I question, what is an education about? A healing process involves reconciliation. Seth told me the story of an American veteran who returned to Vietnam. William Broyles, who has written several books about about the war and, and served over there. And he goes back also to Vietnam and he goes to this village where he fought. And he meets a woman there and they start discussing the war and it turns out that her husband was killed in this village. And Broyles asks her when and she says, she gives some date and he goes, well, I was in the village then. I fought here when your husband was killed. I may in fact have killed your husband. And she says to him, in this extraordinary moment, that was then, now you're here. And I think that capacity to forgive that vets from both sides are able to see that brings them together in, in a re most remarkable way. Every day in Vietnam, we witness the capacity of both sides to forgive and to move on. Americans and Vietnamese have come together in remarkable ways. Although there may never be full agreement on why we went to war, we can all celebrate the reconciliation. This is the skeleton of a school we visited in Quang Tri, destroyed during the war. But Vietnam is not concerned with the past. Its focus is today and tomorrow. Here is the English school Tui and I built in a partnership between our two countries. In March 2008, the opening festivities were held. The school will remain a symbol of what has been accomplished in our ongoing efforts of reconciliation. I saw resilience in these students' smiles, forgiveness in every vet's handshake, and hope in each new American-Vietnamese joint venture. We have come a long way. Each war teaches its lessons. Long after a war is over, the pain can remain, but with time, each side learns to better understand its former enemy. We should have learned that we do not always have solutions to all the world's problems, that we need to better understand different peoples and cultures, that we must live together. That is the final lesson 